Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, uh, my name is Pete Wilkinson. I'm the chairman of Together Against Size Rule C. I'd like to thank the members of Size Rule C and the people who manage this hall for putting on this evening and doing all the backroom work to make it happen. I'd like to thank you very much for coming this evening. But most of all, I'd like to thank our speaker, Jonathan, for coming to see us and helping us promote the anti-nuclear cause that we espouse for the second time in a year. It's a very good of him to spend some of his precious time coming all the way up from, from London to come and talk to us this evening. I don't have to tell you, I'm sure, how eminent a person we've got here this evening. Jonathan's been a constant voice of criticism against the nuclear industry for many, many years, longer than I can remember, and I've known him for a very long time. He's an eminent writer, broadcaster. He's an author and commentator on sustainable development. He established Forum for the Future in 1996, which is a leading sustainable development charity with 70 staff and 100 partner organizations. It works not only in the UK, but is increasing its presence in the USA, India, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaysia. He was Director of Friends of the Earth, my old organization, from 1984 to 1990. He was co-chair of the Green Party. I'm not making this up, it goes on and on. He was chair of the UN Environmental Development in the UK from 1993 to 1996, chair of the Sustainability Southwest, trustee of World Wildlife Fund from 1991 to 2005, board member of the Southwest Regional Development Agency. And he is today co-founder of the Prince of Wales Business and Sustainability Program, running seminars for senior executives. He's a non-executive of the Wilmot Dixon Holdings, trustee of the Ashton Awards for Sustainable Energy, and is involved in the work of many NGOs, charities, and charities as patron, chair, and special advisor. He's Chancellor of the Keele University and Visiting Professor at Loughborough University. In 2000, he was awarded a CBE for Services to the Environment. We are truly privileged to have him here. No one else that I know deserves that award better than he. Please give a Suffolk welcome to Jonathan Porrick. Thank you very much, Pete. That's uh, a very warm welcome. Delighted to be here again to talk a little bit about the nuclear industry, about how it impacts on the people here in this part of the world, how it impacts on people down in Somerset, around Hinkley Point, which is, uh, I live in Cheltenham, so I've been very closely involved in the Hinkley Point campaign, as you can imagine, and to talk a bit more broadly about energy issues in general and this quite unbelievable situation that we find ourselves in now with the government committed to a so-called nuclear renaissance. I put this in inverted commas, okay, speech marks, a nuclear renaissance with a price tag that nobody can actually quite believe because even the first of the elements in the nuclear renaissance, namely Hinkley Point, let alone what might happen at Sizewell or at Bradwell, the price tag for the first element in the nuclear renaissance is so large as to stagger belief, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and secondly, of course, we have increasingly come to understand that we don't really need this renaissance anyway. We've got a brilliant energy renaissance going on here in the UK already and in the rest of the world in terms of renewable energy. So that's sort of what I'm going to be talking about. So coming up on the train this, this evening, which was, I love coming up on the train and catching up on my reading. And so I was reading this week's issue of New Scientist, because I'm not a scientist myself, so I have to constantly refresh myself in terms of understanding what's going on. And on the same page, for those who read the New Scientist, uh, this is page five, I came across two little items that precisely capture where we are in terms of the energy debate today. So here's the first little snippet, which is a tiny story about the International Atomic 
Energy Agency, okay, which is the kind of global body that sits over the whole of the nuclear industry in all the different countries around the world. A nuclear power plant was targeted by a cyber attack two to three years ago, according to the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Yukiya Amano did not give any details of the cyber attack and was not allowed to mention the nuclear reactor, but told Reuters that the hack caused, quotes, some disruption, quotes, and that the threat posed to the nuclear facilities by the cyber attack was serious. So just store that one away, okay? Because we don't know very much about what the security forces all around the world are having to do to protect nuclear facilities against cyber attacks and cyber terrorism of this kind, because you won't be surprised to know they don't really want us to know about this for fear that we might get a little upset at the idea that all our nuclear facilities of one kind or another, including our reactors, are subject to that kind of cyber risk today. So that was a bit depressing, but then I scanned down the page and I came across the second article. Futuristic farms, first tomatoes. Now this may not seem an equivalent story in terms of the weight, but trust me, this is really good. Sunshine and seawater, that's all it takes, a vast new greenhouse in the South Australian desert to produce 17,000 tons of tomatoes a year. <coughs> So here's the deal. I won't read the whole article. It's quite interesting. But they pump seawater roughly two kilometers from the ocean to this plant, which is in the middle of the desert. And in the middle of the desert, they've constructed, constructed what is called a concentrated solar power plant. So this isn't photovoltaic cells like we see here in the UK with the PV cells mounted close to the ground. This is a different solar technology which captures the incoming solar radiation and beams it onto this tower, which heats the water up to an incredibly high temperature, which produces steam, which then produces the electricity and everything else that they need. So this CSP plant is sufficient to desalinate the seawater that has been pumped two kilometers in from the ocean to produce all the water that they need to irrigate 180,000 tomato plants inside this massive tomato greenhouse. The solar power is generated by 23,000 mirrors that reflect the sunlight onto a 115 meter high tower on a sunny day producing 39 megawatts of power. Now, to be honest, this stuff is getting more and more normal. Different breakthroughs of different kinds of solar technology in different parts of the world, creating solutions to different problems that confront humankind at every turn. This kind of story is to a penny now all over the place. And yet here in the UK, we're still stuck in this extraordinary world where we're told that the only solution to the UK's energy trilemma, and the trilemma, three things, that have to be met at the same time instead of a dilemma, which are the problems about energy security, energy affordability, and low carbon, that the only solution to our energy trilemma here in the UK is more nuclear power. The nuclear renaissance promised us at Hinckley, at Sizewell, and at Bradwell. It is honestly very difficult I'm really getting tired of this thing. I'm going to try. Not necessary to go there yet. <laughs> it may become necessary to go there quite soon, but not right now. <coughs> On this nuclear story, it's definitely premature to give in to despair. And there are three main reasons for that. Firstly, the reactor design that we're being invited to wonder at for Hinckley and then for Sizewell is, as you know, the EPR, the European Pressurized Water Reactor. There are four EPRs currently under construction elsewhere in the world. One in Finland, 
at a place called Ol Kiliotto, one in France at a place called Flamanville, and two in China at a place called Taishan. The Finnish EPR is now so beyond its construction finish time and so beyond the estimated budget that was set for it that it's actually impossible for EDF, the company involved in promoting the EPR, to give a proper account any longer of how much this reactor is going to cost. That's because they're now sunk deep in a legal battle with the Finnish energy authorities, which will go on and on for it. In Flamanville, in France itself, EDF's home country, obviously, as you know, they're sunk into the same kind of delays and the same kind of story about cost overruns. And there's a particular little story about Flamanville, which I'll come back to. In China, to be honest, we don't really know how late the reactor delivery is. We just know that they didn't come on stream at the time that the Chinese authorities said that they were coming on stream. And of course, nobody knows the degree to which the costs are out of control in China. You never get to hear any of that stuff, which is why you'll never get to hear anything from CGN, from the Chinese nuclear company that is now involved in Hinkley, and would, of course, be involved here at Sizewell. A very eminent nuclear engineer based at Cambridge University gave a speech about a year ago now talking about different nuclear technologies. He's very pro-nuclear. But he described the EPR design as unconstructible. <laughs> unconstructible. Because of the complexity because of the way in which the design has had to adapt to different expectations from regulators, from post-Fukushima <coughs> public concern, many different things. So you've had one layered safety feature on top of another safety feature, on top of another. Basically, it's one nuclear reactor surrounded by at least two containment zones to provide the level of safety that the regulators now think is necessary. The costs are unbelievable. And even those people who care passionately about nuclear power would probably agree that the EPR is unconstructible. I don't believe Hinkley Point will ever get completed. I believe it will be started. There is now so much political face involved in this Chinese face, French face, British face, so much embarrassment factor wrapped up in the commitment that we've made to Hinkley Point that the work will probably start. I do not believe Hinkley Point will ever generate any electricity whatsoever. And there is a story about this which is worth noting. In that complicated deal, the three-way deal, Hinkley, Sideswell, Bradwell, there is a clause in that deal that says that if Flamville is not generating electricity, putting electricity into the French grid by 2020, then all the commitments, the undertakings that the British government has given to EDF become null and void. Become null and void. Now, I don't think Flamville will be generating electricity by 2020. In fact, EDF has recently downscaled its commitment to try and deal with the problems of Flamanville because it has so many other problems <coughs> in its reactor fleet in France that it doesn't know what to do with it. So that's the first thing. It might give you a little bit of comfort. I agree that you shouldn't count too much on that, but it might give you a little bit of comfort. Secondly, we haven't really seen the details of the deal. As you know, much of this is obscured in incredible layers of secrecy. It's just remarkable that a decision that could eventually cost the UK taxpayer more than a billion pounds a year over 35 years, that would be the, the full cost of the subsidy when it unfolds, has none of the details, 
critical commercial details have been shared, even with the critical con uh, accounts committee in the Commons and so on. We don't know, for instance, what they're going to do about a nuclear waste at any point. You might think that was a pretty important issue, given how much money we're paying today to deal with the nuclear waste from all our existing reactors, but no one has yet been able to say how the waste at Hinkley Point will be dealt with. So there are just so many things that still have to be sorted out. And at the same time as the government is trying to do all of this, the whole of the rest of the energy world is being transformed around it. And that's what I really want us to focus on this evening. I think nuclear technology is a desperately tired, old technology, incapable of meeting our needs for the future, massively expensive, quite problematic in terms of the risk that we run with it through security threats of one kind or another, hugely problematic. But the reason why it will fail is it cannot possibly compete with the new energy paradigm that is there for us to enjoy today. And I just want you to take time out from your kind of size world blues, as it were, which are bound to be fairly prevalent, I admit, but just take time out from that and just think about what is happening at the moment. This new energy paradigm depends on just four things happening simultaneously. First, renewables going bananas at the moment, which is incredible. Secondly, incredible breakthroughs in storage technology, which I'll explain the significance of. Thirdly, unbeknownst to this government, it would seem, we're having tremendous success in actually building prosperity without increasing the amount of energy that we need. We're seeing a reduction year on year in electricity consumption. You wouldn't know that when you listen to the government that constantly tells you the lights are going to go out this winter, whatever it might be. And fourthly, perhaps most excitingly, this dramatic series of breakthroughs in the way that we can distribute electricity through a different kind of grid structure. <coughs> Not relying on great big central grid systems, but increasingly coming to use smaller scale mini grids all the way through to local area grids, which create a much more elegant, effective, cheap way of giving people the electricity services they need. So on each of those in turn, just on the renewable story, honestly you couldn't write the stuff. Um, I wrote a book called The World We Made, which I finished in 2012, and in that book I said that by the end of 2016 we would have had a complete revolution in solar power and the world would have already decided at the end of 2016 that our energy future depended increasingly on solar and wind. Now, it seemed like a brave punt at the end of 2012. Right now, you would find that kind of projection everywhere in the pages of the bloody economies, which I take as a kind of bastion of really quite old-fashioned, orthodox economic thinking. In the pages of the Daily Telegraph, which I take as an even more orthodox bastion of conservative thinking, you will find these projections now to a penny. And that is for one simple reason these technologies work, they're reliable, the quality that we're getting through wind and solar investments now is amazing, the return for investors is good, and the cost keeps on coming down. Every year, every year, by five or six percent every year. In fact, the last six months have been dramatic in terms of reductions in solar power. Globally, this is. Two huge deals have been done recently. Massive, these are massive deals, multi-megawatt deals for new solar farms, PV-type solar arrays. In Dubai and Abu Dhabi, joint deal, and in China. 
And these two deals have set a new low price for solar that is competing any other single form of energy available in the marketplace today. That's in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, spot the kind of energy system of choice in that part of the world, and in China. Every year, every year, the costs keep coming down. So much so that the economist, in the recent report they did, they reckoned that by the end of 2018, more than 35 countries would have access to solar power at what is called grid parity which means pretty much as cheap per delivered unit of energy as you'll get from any other source. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary. Now, add to that, because of course, as you will have spotted, the sun doesn't shine at night. That's what the nuclear industry goes on and on telling us. Those nuclear reactors, they hum away night and day, the poor old sun only shines during the day. So it's a helplessly inefficient source of energy for our modern always-on economy. <coughs> and actually, to be fair, if we haven't found some really smart way of using the energy that's generated during the day at the time when we need it, which is often at night, then we're in a bit of a pickle. So the second most exciting thing is the breakthroughs in storage technology. I swear to God, nobody gets excited about storage. You have to be quite sad. It's <laughs> really exciting about batteries. Until you listen to Elon Musk. Now, Elon Musk is a get-up-and-go entrepreneur who would make you excited about anything, whether it's going to Mars or building a Hyperloop transport system to take people from San Francisco to New York. 35 minutes, or doing astonishing things with the Tesla motor car, or building what is called the Gigafactory, because obviously a mega factory is just too small for Elon Musk. <laughs> the Gigafactory in Nevada is just nearing the end of its construction cycle. The first batteries will start emerging from the Gigafactory in early December, and these batteries are going to bring down the price point through the Tesla Powerwall. Got to get the terminology going here, okay? Got to get your adrenaline going. <laughs> the Tesla Powerwall will start bringing down the cost of ordinary battery-based storage. It's just a box standard battery, to be honest. Smart box standard battery, but still just a battery. To a quite dramatic extent. And because Elon Musk has got out there and said, you know what, the future of humankind depends on storage. No one's ever said that before. Elon Musk, first person on planet Earth to say something as groundbreaking as the future of humankind depends on storage. Because <coughs> this is Elon Musk's lesson to the masses, as it were, every single competitor in the world is now saying, you know what? We can do batteries better than that. I think Elon Musk. We've been making batteries for years, and in China, in Japan, elsewhere in America, in Germany, they're all saying, what's so special about Elon Musk and his batteries? We can make batteries more competitively, sell them cheaper, more reliably than Elon Musk. You've suddenly got a global marketplace in storage technology, which is something to behold. So anticipate this. Every year, from now on, cost of storage will come down as fast as the cost of solar power. As fast as the cost of solar power. So the combination of these two things means that every single person of school age here in Suffolk today should anticipate living in a home, house, or whatever, a yurt, for all I know, which will be pretty much capable of going completely off-grid, not because you're a kind of hippie anarchist, but pretty much off-grid because you won't need the grid. You won't need all those electrons.
pulsing out from the size world because the combination of energy efficiency, solar, storage, smart grid systems, local areas working together to create their own energy systems will be ubiquitous within the next 10 to 15 years. <coughs> I am not on something tonight, okay? <laughs> I'm not selling you dodgy moonshine about an energy future that has always been just over the next horizon, as it's been for me since I started this work more than 40 years ago. It's always just over the horizon, okay? And I must admit, I felt my credibility was somewhat at risk since I kept on saying, no, trust me, it's just around the corner, it's coming. <coughs> it's here. I don't have to any longer try and get up on a soapbox and sell this as a potential for the future. This is now. This is happening right now. <coughs> just look at the few little success stories if you want to test this out. Look at what's happening in Denmark, wind and solar combined together. Look at what happens in Costa Rica. Last year, Costa Rica isn't quite the world's first completely carbon neutral country. But last year in Costa Rica, 299 days out of 365, the country was powered 100% by renewable energy. 100% by renewable energy. In Germany, on something like 22 days this year, renewable energy has provided more than 60% of the electricity that that country needs. On a couple of occasions, it actually provided 100% not for very long, but 100% of the electricity. So this stuff is not fantasy. This is happening. And it's happening just at the speed that people cannot understand. And I'm sorry to say, the people who seem least capable of understanding it are you know who. <laughs> people sitting in Treasury, people sitting in the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. No one quite knows how to pronounce the acronym yet, so we have to spell it out. Is it B's? Is it B's? Is it B's? We know, don't know, but in the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, this reality is so far away from their thoughts of an energy secure future for the UK as still to be fantasy, not reality. So the truth is the UK is going to miss out horribly on this. We're going to miss out horribly because we still think we need great, big, clunky power stations connected to huge distribution systems, grid-based systems of the kind that we've grown up with and got very used to. And that nothing on the, the sort of field of innovation today is going to change that basic paradigm. Honestly, we're all a little bit, not all, just scanning the average age of this hall tonight. We're a little bit past getting too excited about technology. But if you're a young person today and you're looking at what this means, it is utterly, you know, I'm going to say it, electrifying. <laughs> <laughs> and it is electrifying. It's astonishing. It's a revolution in our lives right now. Right now. So for me, this is something that offers more hope than just the fact that the nuclear industry will probably never get its act together. Because in a way, this emerging set of new opportunities, new technologies, innovation, new skills, building different sources of wealth for the future. And let's not dismiss the importance of what the nuclear industry does in terms of contribution to local economies, jobs, etc., etc. The new energy paradigm has to be at least as good in providing jobs and meeting people's needs in that way as the nuclear industry has ever been. And I'm absolutely convinced that it will be. Fascinating report from a rather remote body called the National Infrastructure Commission that did a detailed analysis of what would happen if the government, so this is an advisory body to the government, set up by the government to advise the government came out with a very interesting report uh, earlier in the year, which it said, if we took energy efficiency and demand management really seriously, 
If we just said the prosperity of this country depends on putting these things at the heart of our industrial strategy, at the heart of what we need to do for our built environment, at the heart of policies to address pretty wicked problems like fuel poverty, if we did all of that and we committed to a 20-year investment period in efficiency and demand management, we would come up with four times the equivalent amount of energy saved rather than energy produced. That Hinkley Point will produce for a significant saving of eight billion pounds. So instead of 32 billion, it would be an expensive investment, but it would produce four times the equivalent amount of Hinkley Point. So, we're beginning to see this energy system change in front of our eyes. Okay. So for me, this is really exciting. But then, you're going to ask me as soon as I sit down, so I might as well try and answer the question now. Okay. So if all of that amazing stuff is happening, and the nuclear industry is a kind of really, really sad cul-de-sac that is unlikely to make anything other than a marginal contribution to the energy needs of humankind in an ultra-low carbon future. Why are we in the UK? Why are we still committed to this massive investment in a technology that almost certainly can't deliver the goods? What is going on? And you can imagine, as a dying in the wool anti-nuclear campaigner for a very, as I said, for a very, very long time, I look at what's happened at Hinkley Point and I ask myself, how is it possible for a government that has one or two rational and reasonable people in it, how is it possible to come up with a decision of that kind when practically everybody else thinks it's a ludicrous decision? And this is where it gets a bit murky, okay? This is where you would probably have cause to take one step closer to the onset of despair. Because the reasons have nothing to do with conventional energy policy. And they have everything to do with a sad, nostalgic belief that the UK still needs to be a nuclear weapons power in order to command respect in the world and to use the cliche, keep our seat at the table. Now, in case you think I've given in to really bad paranoia and conspiracy theory here, if you are really interested in this, I urge you to look at a fascinating report just published by the Science Policy Research Unit, called SPRU, Science Policy Research Unit, at Sussex University, who a few weeks ago produced a report saying, you know, this is weird. This doesn't add up. What are the reasons why the government might have decided to do this at Hinkley Point? And they go through every single one of the apparent reasons why you might do it. Energy security, far better ways of doing that. Keeping costs down, give me a break. Okay, it's the most expensive way of imposing more cost on consumers that you can possibly imagine. Low carbon, really? I don't think so. So they run through all the reasons why a government coming from a rational position might decide to put its eggs back into an already corrupted nuclear basket. And one by one, they say, there's no rational reason, there's no conceivable reason why the government would do it for this reason. So they then come to a very different conclusion, which is that we are making this huge multi-billion pound investment in Nuclear Point, and maybe in the future, Sizeable and Bradwell, because without that investment, we cannot maintain a sufficient capability in nuclear skills to enable us to maintain and keep up our nuclear deterrent and the Trident system. And there's a very detailed historical analysis about the incredibly close connection. Weapons and civil nuclear power. 
even after the period when the two were meant to be split apart completely. Because at a certain point, back in the 60s, the government actually said, OK, still going to keep our nuclear weapons capability going, but our nuclear power industry now needs to be completely different, because actually we keep on building reactors that are more about producing plutonium than about producing energy, so we're going to get serious about producing real energy. There was meant to be a split between the two. And this Sprue report goes right back and looks at the way in which that split never happened. It never happened. And the nuclear weapons industry, our military capability, is still incredibly closely enmeshed with our nuclear civil industry. And when you're talking about skills, these are generic. You could go one way or the other. When you're using your skills as a nuclear engineer, you can go and use your skills at Aldermaston to help build whatever we'll be building with our trident replacement program, or you can go and use your skills at size C. C. <laughs> but if you don't have a given reserve of professionalism, skills in the industry, you can't do the weapons. So it's a really intriguing report, and I have come to the unfortunate conclusion that it is the power of the nuclear weapons industry, represented not just in the Ministry of Defense, but in big companies like Rolls-Royce and BAE, that has said to the government, you don't have a choice here. If you want Britain to remain an independent nuclear power, it's a bit of a joke about the notion of independence, but let's not go there tonight. If you want us to remain an independent nuclear power, you have to maintain a skills base. And the only way of maintaining a skills base now is to pump tens of billions of pounds into Hinkley Point. It's a very compelling argument. So let me finish by inviting you to enjoy the massive irony of what this means for the UK. A little bit lost at the moment, let's be honest. Not quite sure where we're going in terms of our destiny as a nation any longer. Just celebrate this one particular mega irony that has suddenly engulfed us, okay? So just go through the logic of this. So just buy the sprue argument, okay? That we are building Hinkley, Maybe Sizemore, maybe Bradwell after that. We'll get on to some further <coughs> discussion about that. This, because we have to, to maintain our nuclear deterrent capability. And one of the reasons why we still need that nuclear deterrent capability is to deal with prospective, aggressive superpowers such as China. You <laughs> <laughs> see where I'm going with this. They do still do these scenarios about what uses a UK nuclear deterrent might be put at some point in the future. And one of the scenarios they play out is what would happen if China decided to eat Taiwan, just be done with it as an irritant of its coastline, and just gobble it back into the system, despite all the promises from America and the Western powers, if China did that, that would be tantamount to a declaration of war. So they play these scenarios, and China is in these scenarios as a potential hostile power, that we would, in that event, and possibly others, need to go to war with, including the possible threat of using our nuclear deterrent. Okay. That's position one. Now go to position two. Having decided we need a nuclear renaissance in order to maintain our nuclear deterrent, we suddenly discover we haven't got enough money. So we have to go find the money somewhere else. And the best place to go and find the money is China. <laughs> <coughs> so George Osborne makes five trips to China, five trips to China, with the biggest begging bowl in the world to say, we have a great new investment opportunity for you. To come in with us, squeaky clean government, EDF, brilliant, you 
nuclear superpower and build this wondrous new nuclear reactor on the Somerset coast. And the Chinese weigh it up, which <coughs> is a company called CGN. They weigh it up, they say, you know, well, actually, yeah, I'm sure it's a brilliant rate of return, but if, if you'll go a little bit further than the nuclear point, and if you'll go next to Sizewell, and then after that, you'll go to Bradwell, and at Bradwell, you'll let us build our reactor, not that poxy French I was starting to be filled with optimism, and then I was getting a bit paranoid, so I guess I was sort of filled with paranoid optimism at the end of that, mm. but thank you very much, Jonathan. That was, that was very enlightening and uh, very thought-provoking. Thank you so much. What we'll do now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take some questions, 
Uh, Jonathan will answer the, the bigger picture, if you like. If you've got questions about Sizewell, I'll try to field them, or I might pass them to Joan or other members of the Together Against Sizewell C Committee for, for responses. Who's got a question for Jonathan on what have we just heard? Yes, sir. The sun is shining somewhere. Not here. Sorry, say again. I'm still dubious on, ba I'm still oh, dubious on batteries. And wonder if the money wouldn't be better spent on a gigantic east-west supergrid, so that we transfer powers from sunshine places to nighttime places. Yeah. As the Earth rotates. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm really understanding of that comment. I, I I honestly used to be really doubtful about batteries because, you know, for all the obvious reasons, and then. Five years ago, I went on a visit to China. I was invited to go and look at... Yeah, sorry, I made the connection. I wasn't invited to go and look at their nuclear weapons capability, but I was invited to go and look at some of the things they were doing on renewable energy. And one of the companies that I went to visit was a company called Build Your Dreams, BYD, which is one of the largest car manufacturing and battery uh, manufacturing companies <coughs> In the world, actually, it's the second largest in China, and it's, it's vast. And I was, I'm not saying I had a kind of epiphany, but I was certainly exposed to a way of thinking about this that was completely different, because the team of people that we were invited to talk to, which wasn't the bigwigs, they were the engineers, said two things. Firstly, China is asphyxiating. We, we, can't, we can't give our citizens what they want, which is an opportunity to breathe. And by and large, that's a perfectly reasonable request for a citizen in any nation state. We can't do that. And we can go on closing power stations, but what we cannot do is stop middle-class Chinese wanting to buy cars. Because if we did, the consequences would be devastating. So we are going to have to go electric. We don't really have a choice about that, because clean internal combustion engine is going to take such a long time to get to that point. So we're going to go electric. And we're going to build better and cheaper than any other car manufacturer in the world. And to do that, we're going to have to crack the battery issue. And then they showed us their research. I'm sure they didn't show us anything confidential, don't worry. But they showed us the research unit in BYD, where they were just testing out something like eight different battery designs, lithium-ion, lithium-air, different kind of technologies they were playing with, non-lithium-type batteries, you know, the whole story. And I looked at that and I said, my God, how long does it take to get from a design of this kind to full manufacturing capability? And they said, well, it doesn't take very long, to be honest, because by and large, as long as we can provide the basics that the regulator needs, we can go into production very quickly. So their goal was to replace something like, I need to think carefully about this, something like 20% of the cars on the road in China, the internal combustion engine cars with electric cars, 20% by 2020. And they're well on the way to doing that. It's up to about 6% now. Um, but as you know, these things tend to go quite slowly and then the curve goes a lot faster. I don't know whether they'll make it or not. Um, but that, for me, was an absolute eye-opener as to the strategic importance of battery technology. So I became a bit more of a battery, uh, battery enthusiast. This is before I started listening to Elon Musk, before I was mainlining Elon Musk, you know, whenever I was close to the abyss, and you just, you just have to say the mantra, stream Elon Musk, just... Listen to Elon Musk, because he'll get you back from the abyss quite quickly. Because that man thinks there is a solution to every single problem on planet Earth. And they aren't all dependent on flying more and more people to Mars. Although I know some people who definitely would benefit from a trip to Mars right now. <laughs> definitely. So I do do a lot of kind of Elon Musk up, as it were, in my dark moments. So, but this, this China story was fascinating to me, and I did begin to change. And, and, I, I, and I'm just watching the Powerwall story now. They're... They're going live here in the UK in, at the end of November. And the price point will probably be about eight, 9,000 um, pounds. Quite a lot of advanced orders are being placed. 
by people who are thinking longer term about how they can use this with their own self-generation. I think that price point will need to come way down before you get serious market penetration. Eight, nine thousand pounds is still far too much for people to afford. But if it comes down to three, four thousand pounds and you're already committed to your solar array and you're starting to talk to your neighbors about how you could combine your energy generation, generating efforts to do a really good shared job. I, you know, for me, this is stuff is happening. Thanks, Jonathan. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, surely there's a, 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 a huge distance between the solar panels on our roof and actually being able to use that electricity ourselves let alone share it with the neighbours who have to put up with looking at it. Oh, are you that keen on normal roofing technology? No, but it's the revolution that seems to be required for the, for the disconnect yes. to be... No, you with. are in fact entirely right. And the main impediment to this revolution happening is the problems of dealing with grid connection and the astonishing unfairness about what happens when you sell your power back into the grid. So I don't know if anybody's in this position now, but you will know if you're generating a surplus and you sell to the grid, you will be receiving a price that is roughly, depends on what your current tariff is, but roughly a third of the price you have to pay for the energy that you take back off the grid. Now this is a structural inequity which obviously needs to be resolved. I totally agree with you about that. And this is where the fight will be. In America now, for instance, the utilities are digging in and they're saying, our whole existence is at risk if more and more people go on investing in solar power and get themselves close to being able to come off grid. Because we've still got to pay for the investment in that grid infrastructure. We've got to pay for maintenance. We've got to pay for the service that they're connected to, even if they don't want to use it any longer. So they're fighting furiously to stop people from being able to set up these smaller communities where they could make themselves independent of the grid. You're absolutely right. That is, that's where the fight's going to be. Entirely agree with you. By the way, on the aesthetics of solar, um, I, they are a bit, they're not always they're very aesthetic, are they? Um, but I don't know if you've seen the latest solar tiles, which I do love. I mean, this is a different kind of story when you look at it. It's not stuck on there like a kind of alien thingy that dropped on your roof during the night. These are designed and built into the structure of the roof, and they look different. And uh, personally, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I, you know, roofs have never done it for me anyway, so I really don't <coughs> mind roofs covered with... Um, solar cells, to be honest. I get quite excited by it, but then I get excited by wind turbines, so, you know, I'm a bit of a lost cause in that respect. But when we get to solar tiles being the technology of choice, I think that will address that concern. Thanks, Jonathan. Next question, please. Yes, sir. In the middle there. Which one, Pete? Uh, the, the four yeah. along. This row? No, yeah, next one up, up, four along. Five along, sorry. Why are the batteries so expensive? What they've done so far is to take the technology that was used to power a lot of electrical and electronic goods, so our phones and our iPads and computers and all the rest of it, and take that technology and basically try and resize it, reformat it for use in cars. So. Part of the breakthrough has been to shift the technology from one sector to another sector. And that has proved to be very expensive. One of the things that Elon Musk has promised that he'll be able to do with his gigafactory is to bring forward battery-based technologies that are designed for that purpose, for the power wall purpose, energy storage, and for the car. For the, his Teslas in the first instance. And of course, the Tesla is a much um, admired 
uh, car in the USA. It's very popular. People have put in an incredible number of advanced orders for the latest Tesla model. So that's why he's so confident that he can get the price points down. And then I was mentioning these other competitors. I was listening to somebody the other day on behalf of Panasonic, um, which is a big Japanese conglomerate, makes tons of stuff. I mean, just unbelievable number of, of consumer goods, fridges, all the way through to electrical things. To They've got the smartest fuel cell, domestic scale fuel cell using hydrogen. That is just such a brilliant technology, you can hardly believe it. And it's, it's still too expensive to deploy at scale, but hospitals and schools in Japan are now buying the Panasonic fuel cell because it's such a clean, amazing technology. Panasonic has just brought out a new battery configuration, which they, I don't think, it's not on sale in the UK yet, but for sale in Southeast Asia, which is 20% cheaper than Elon Musk's power. So, what happens when engineers get going on this and they then import a lot of the skills from Silicon Valley and they start thinking about new materials and new markets is you get this convergence of really brilliant people whose principal purpose then is about driving down price. Because without driving down price, you can't get the scale that you need. I fear you may have been asking me a technical question around why lithium-ion batteries are so expensive. Um, you'd have to ask someone who knows about chemistry and physics <coughs> to get a reliable answer to that question. I'm really sorry. I did, I did declare that I'm not a scientist to start with, okay, but there will be a good answer to that, which I don't have available to me. I'm sorry. That's okay, Jonathan. You're forgiven. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Next question, please. Anybody? Reagan? Okay. Um, this depends a lot on how deep into this counter argument that I've put forward you want to go. Because it was very interesting. The Chinese did not want to do just Hinkley Point. The negotiating position, they said right from the start, is, yep, we can come in at Hinkley and we can provide part of the gap. Because don't forget, not all the money for Hinkley has been found yet. EDF still has to find a big slug of money because there's nothing on its balance sheet, as you know. It's technically bankrupt. So they've got to go to the market and find an extra tranche of money. But the Chinese came in and provided roughly a third. And they said, that we can do that. That's easy. But we're not just interested in Hinkley. We're interested in using the UK as a springboard for our nuclear expertise in terms of sales to the rest of the world. And they then went on to say, that probably isn't going to be selling EPRs to the rest of the world, because we're building our two EPRs in China at the moment, and frankly, they're Turkey. So we don't want to do anything like that. But we're really excited by our own re emer emerging reactor designs. And it's not just, well, on one, they've got three or four reactor designs, I think, which are sort of under consideration in China. So they pressed the point. If you want the money for Hinkley, you've got to do a three-way deal with us. And my belief is that the real prize for them was the opportunity to bring forward their own reactor design, 100% designed, funded, constructed, managed, and operated by CGN, by the Chinese company. That was the prize. <coughs> and to do that, they definitely came up with the Hinkley goods. We don't quite know the size of the commitment for uh, Sizewell. No, nobody's certain what that would look like. Um, I, will it, you see, I just, you look at the deal for Hinkley Point, so much money has had to be produced to make Hinkley work as a deal. Could they do it all over again for Sizewell? Another billion pounds a year on consumers' bills to do the same at Sizewell as they've done at Hinkley? Really? I, you just think at some point consumers are going to say, you promised us that hard-working families, because that's Mrs. May's 
favorite trope, that hard-working families would not be disadvantaged by the deal that we're doing on nuclear. Now, you, we're disadvantaged to the tune of a, a billion pounds a year. Nobody disputes this figure, by the way. This is absolutely agreed by everybody. Could they, would they do it again for Sizewell and then again for Bradwell? Three billion pounds a year to keep three reactors ticking over? I, these sums are off any known scale of, of credibility. At the time when we're using less energy, costs are coming down, efficiencies are increasing, uh, you know, the, the amount we'd have to pay for Hinkley and the amount we'd have to pay for Sizewell then becomes a far higher proportion of our total energy bill because we're getting all the benefits of efficiency and increasing the benefits of cheaper renewables. I don't think it adds up. I admit I may be trying to persuade myself. Um, Pete, what's the sort of thinking about the cost of Sizewell? See, I mean, it's... Well, they're, they're, we're nowhere near understanding the cost. More Sorry. Expensive. Excuse me? More expensive than Hinkley. More expensive than Hinkley. Well, absolutely, yeah. Hmm, okay. But there are, I mean, I don't know if you agree, Jonathan, there are, there are parallels between what's happening now with this nuclear renaissance and what happened in the 80s. Yeah. In the 80s, Thatcher wanted one pressurised water reactor a year for 10 years. She got one. She got Sizewell. Yeah. And the, the, the city killed the rest off because it was just so expensive. And now we've got a situation where we've got this nuclear renaissance. Hinkley is the forerunner. Maybe they'll get Hinkley to save face, as Jonathan was saying earlier, but hopefully the rest will fall because it's just a ridiculous proposition to go beyond Hinkley. Well, even Hinkley is a ridiculous proposition, but they may have to go that far in order to keep yeah. their face, as Jonathan was saying. Is there any more questions, please? Um, Yes, sir, down there. Thank you. Uh, don't forget that side of the room, Pete. No, I won't. I'll come over there in a second. Oh. So, thank you. Uh, I'm going to make two points. I'm going to cheat. Um, I, think the, you, I think the conspiracy starts with, with access to the grid. Or not, it goes on anyway. Because access to the grid is controlled by the, the big six. Yep. There's, a, there's a, a, a book of a thousand or so pages with vast numbers of rules that you have to um, abide by to get access to the grid to sell electricity. And that, that, those, those rules are written by the big six and controlled by the big six. Is that better? Controlled by the big six, which means basically that clean energy is, is, is told in many parts of the country, in the southwest, for instance, that there's no room in the grid. Yep. Uh, and therefore, it's a conspiracy by the big six to keep out clean energy. And so I think one of our demands must be a, a merit order, that though the clean energy gets first access to the grid and polluting energy gets last access to the grid. I think that's the first thing to break the conspiracy. The second thing to break the conspiracy is to end the ridiculous situation whereby it is illegal, as you said already, to sell electricity to your neighbours unless you have a supply licence. Yep. That costs you in excess of a million pounds. Yep. So you can't do it. And the third part of the conspiracy is the current subsidy situation. Uh, you've mentioned the one billion pound a year for Hinkley C. Uh, Hinkley C. Yes. But, but there's also the subsidies given to renewables uh, and, and fossil fuels. In, 19, in 2014, the government subsidy to renewables was 3.5 billion. The government subsidy to energy efficiency was half a million. The government subsidy to, to polluting uh, fossil fuels was 26 billion. In other words, seven times that uh, given to uh, renewables and 104 times that given to energy efficiency. So that, I think there's the, there's the three elements of the conspiracy. That, that the subsidies are favouring pollution, that access to the grid is controlled by the big six, and if you get, even if you get past the 1,000 rules that you have to abide by, you have to pay a million or two pounds to get access to green. And it's that, that we have to break. Yep. Thank you, Ron. Totally agree with you. And actually, it is remarkable when you look at these figures of what, what it would cost you just to begin to get this system moving at scale around communities. So let me give you a little snippet of where they're doing it rather differently, which is in... Um, Actually, I'll give you the California example. There's a couple of brilliant examples in Germany. But in California now, 
um, where they have woken up a bit late, by the way, to solar. They're now going absolutely all guns blazing on solar power. There are now a number of schemes where houses that are in those kind of... Um, you know how the Americans build some of their suburbs. They're, they're sort of... They're separated from the rest of the suburb. 30, 40 houses in a little enclave. Not necessarily gated communities, but, but you know, they're, they're sort of self-contained. Um, there's a scheme that I read about in New Scientist um, just a few months ago, which is where 32 houses in one of these um, enclaves has decided they're all going to invest in solar power. And these are big houses. You know, America builds big houses. Um, at the same time, they're going to invest in batteries. And they're going to create their own local grid. And they're going to use a new technology called blockchain to establish a trading system. Blockchain is being used all over the place now to provide people <coughs> with encrypted data, totally secure, totally transparent to anybody involved in that trading network. And they're going to use this new technology so that every single transaction when someone is purchasing, selling, using, charging, whatever it might be, will be instantly transparent between all the members of this community. Interestingly, they're not going to take themselves off the grid immediately because they said something might go wrong. You know, this might not work. So we'll stay connected to the grid, not least because we want to sell more of our energy back into the grid, but this is how we're going to do it. And in America, in this part of California, they have an energy utility that will make this financially viable. Totally in contrast to what would happen here in the UK if a group of people here in Albra or Leyston or wherever it might be, said, you know what, we're going to combine forces, we're going to overcome the limitations of the UK winter sun, we're going to create this wondrous, nearly off-grid community, and we're going to sell to each other and sell into the grid and buy our electric cars and our Tesla power packs and all the rest of it, the grid would look at you and say, yep, yeah, it'll cost you several million pounds if you want to do that, and if you really want to sell to each other, that'll cost you tens of millions of pounds. And it is a fix. It is corrupt. It is the big six that wrote the rules. You were very generous in your comments. You didn't include Ofgem in your list of conspirators. You need to put them right at the top, because Ofgem basically goes on licensing the big six to go on fleecing us year after year after year. So, right up there, off Jim. National Grid, interesting position. New chief executive of the National Grid who gave a stunning speech after she was appointed and basically said, that was yesterday and the future is coming down the track at us and in the National Grid, we're really excited about distributed renewable local energy systems. And it must have made the big six think to themselves, oh my God, someone spotted what's been going on here and maybe it's going to look a bit different. And that chief executive also destroyed the baseload argument as well yeah, exactly. in the same speech. Exactly. People over this side, are, uh, someone right at the back there, please, yes. Uh, thank you. Jonathan, a couple of points. Firstly, because you've been advising government, I wonder whether you can give us any idea as to when and how we can get sight of this devious agreement on Hinkley Point so that we can see all the dirty linen that's in there and perhaps wash it in public and have a May Day to explain it. Uh, the second point is we've talk you've talked about the expensive technology, the EPR, that doesn't work and costs the earth. What about Wilva, where we've got the Japanese coming in under the radar and offering a technology that's been developed, I think, in the States. I think it's the Western House reactor, which seems to be already going ahead there at considerably less cost. Is that going to be... Um, a way that the government is going to look to solve this problem rather than get into bed with EDF and go down the tubes with it. Yeah. Um, on transparency at Hinkley Point, um, I, 
I have no idea. I mean, I, they've managed to keep this thing under wraps on the basis of commercial confidentiality all the way through, and I don't think that's going to change. So unless we have an Edward Snowden figure lurking in the bowels of uh, business, Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, um, I, I honestly don't know if we'll ever get to see that. I mean, even the Commons Accounts Committee was not given access to these figures. The National Audit Office is about to produce its report on the economics of Hinkley Point. A bit late, you might say, and therefore safer for the government. But that will shed a little bit of light, actually. Um, I think that's due out in November, December, something like that. Um, certainly before the end of the year, so that might help. And you're right, we shouldn't get fixated just about the EPR and about Chinese uh, reactor designs. There are many other reactor designs. You mentioned uh, Toshiba and what's going on with the Westinghouse designs. Um, still to go through the, approval, the design approval process, but you're right, it's being pushed ahead. It is apparently a lot cheaper. It might well provide an alternative to the ongoing fiasco with EDF and Arriva, because Arriva is now, the construction company is now being, is being absorbed back into EDF. It might well give the government um, some let out. And then, of course, you've got lots of enthusiasts for fast breeder reactors still, after 40 years of people... I, Pete and I will, can't help laughing a bit about this because throughout our lives, at one time or another, someone has said, this would be the answer to all our problems because if we had a fast breeder reactor, we could use all our nuclear waste and then we'd have a lovely closed loop, a circular system. It's so elegant and wonderful. And every single country that has tried to do this, Russia, China, the UK, America, France, I mean, literally, Japan, three weeks ago, Japan said, we are now axing our fast breeder reactor program at, at Jeanjou. Gone. Finished. And Japan's been one of the most enthusiastic countries for fast breeder reactors. Some people are very keen on what are called small modular reactors with the power on nuclear submarines. Honestly, these enthusiasms, they keep popping up and then somebody says to them, yeah, so it might take about 15 years to get to the point where we could build one of these things. We're not sure how it'll work. So, uh, look, I don't want to... I've been very careful, and Pete will remember, when I was at Friends of the Earth, I got into terrible trouble. I mean, really, really terrible trouble with our local groups network. Always a force to be reckoned with. Um, Which I helped develop. I know. <laughs> Damn you. Um, and uh, actually, it was Brit our local groups network. That's still the heart of Friends of the Earth to me. <coughs> but I invited this character called Jim Lovelock, who some of you will have heard of, to come and give a big set-piece lecture in Friends of the Earth called the John Preedy Memorial Lecture. And I was just... I, I loved the ideas that Jim Lovelock was coming up with, the Gaia hypothesis and all the rest. I thought he was... The most, I still think he's the most amazing man. But he was and still is something of a nuclear enthusiast. And so I got... Tons of letters from distraught local groups saying, What was Friends there? What was I doing as director of Friends there, inviting this known nuclear proselytizer into the heart of the Friends of the Earth network to corrupt the brains of, of nuclear, of anti nuclear activists? And, and we, had a, we had a special board meeting to decide whether the invitation to Jim Lovelock should be withdrawn. And I had to argue and say, Look, we're a grown up organization. We can listen to arguments that we don't agree with. Part of being uh, a properly progressive organization is not just to provide your own echo chamber. Listen to what other people have to say about these things. And if it's Jim Lovelock, he's not going to talk about nuclear power. He's going to talk about lots of other things. But if he wants to say a thing or two about nuclear, we know how to deal with that. So in the end, the board said, no, let's do it. And, and local groups protested outside the... My God. Anyway, sorry, I do love Friends of the Earth still, but it was a bit different in those days. Um, but what I said when I was at Friends of the Earth is Friends of the Earth must never, ever, ever say that nuclear power is an inherently immoral and wicked technology. 
that we must cease to have any dealings with at all. Because you, can't, you, just, you just can't... For all I know, there may be some brilliant person sort of thinking about Elon Musk and the Gigafactory, thinking, you know what? I've got a really brilliant idea about nuclear power. Who just cracks all these problems about nuclear power. There may be somebody out there that does that, that then delivers a safe, reasonably affordable, ultra-low carbon, non-corruptible, you can make the list go on and on, nuclear technology that provides us with an extra, an extra sort of arm in this need to get to an ultra-low carbon future. I don't know. I, I, who knows what innovation holds for the future? So I've always said, don't say no to everything nuclear for all time, because that's stupid. But right now, as I assess all of these new technology, all of these so-called new nuclear technologies, they're all as stale and tired and expensive and irrelevant and dangerous and waste-producing and crazy as the rest of them. So right now I feel confident in saying that isn't going to make a big contribution to a low carbon, affordable low carbon world. I'm holding that tiny little bit of my brain open while it's still there to the possibility that there might be something in the future. Now not everybody in the anti-nuclear movement agrees with me on that. They, they want the whole thing done and dusted, go for renewables, go for smart grids, go for what we've got available to us now, drive the revolution, at which point nuclear becomes irrelevant. And I'm happy about that, obviously. I'm not out there investing in crazy new nuclear solutions, I can assure you. But I don't, I don't want to be part of a movement that is, is closed for the wrong reasons to new possibilities. I think the problem is at the moment that the, the, uh, the balance scales are in the other direction, aren't they? There are huge problems associated with the current incarnation of, of nuclear plants. Exactly. And that's not being addressed at all. I mean, it's totally unethical from my perspective that we are prepared to generate highly radioactive, intensely hot, spent nuclear fuel waste with yep. nowhere for it to go. Yep. Nowhere for it to go at all. And we're passing it on to future generations willy-nilly, without even giving a thought to it. And I, they're the sorts of issues that uh, the industry doesn't want to engage no, with, absolutely. it seems to me. Absolutely. Can we have another couple of questions from this side of the room? Which is, it's there. Just let me deal with people over here first. Any questions from this side of the room, please? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Please do. It's yeah. in the same vein as the gentleman at, uh, at the back asking about the, the reactors uh, being proposed to be built by the uh, Shedding light, yeah, uh, shedding light and the nuclear industry, not a good combination, really. <laughs> not a good combination. I mean, honestly, the, we, we are, I'm not saying that we don't get to hear anything about what's going on in, with these other um, proposals, because there's, you know, there are many other, not many other, but there are four other sites in the UK that are theoretically zoned for nuclear power of one kind or another. It's extremely difficult getting, getting the basics. All we know is that all of these reactor designs are going to have to go through this reactor design approval process. And as soon as they're put into that process, it's a two-year, three-year process. It usually takes three years. Expedited, it can be done apparently in two years if our nuclear installations inspectorate was fully up to strength. And what we now know about our inspectorate is that they are massively under-resourced. They've been losing nuclear engineers because as the old engineers have come to the end of their life, sorry, end of their <laughs> career. <coughs> I was thinking about the lifetime of a reactor, sorry. That's a very bad analogy. As they've come to the end of their career, they, it's harder and harder for the NII to replace them with younger graduating nuclear engineers who've got 
any kind of experience working in the nuclear industry at all, because these nuclear reactors, they don't employ many people. I know, I know people get very concerned about jobs and all the rest of it. Actually, when you look at the sheer, the numbers of people employed, it's not a huge number, as you know. So we're not really providing enough experience for our nuclear engineers to come through the system. So I, uh, expedite it, maybe. Two, three years approval process, who knows what might happen then. And in that process, light is shed on the reactor designs, especially when we're talking about Westinghouse, where their designs are approved for use in America already. You see how easy it is for uh, two died in the war anti nuclear activists to disagree. I'm not going to disagree with you oh, too, too badly, Jonathan, but the, the Office of Nuclear Regulation, which Jonathan refers to, is something I know quite well. I've, I've been contracted to them for a long time. And the, the last meeting that we had with them, uh, they announced that so the government had told the Office of Nuclear Regulation to ensure that in the course of their duties of regulating the nuclear industry, their regulatory duties did not hamper the commercial viability of the industry that they are regulating. <laughs> That's the first thing. And the second thing is that if you ask uh, the Office of Nuclear Regulation for any of their documents that they've used in approving a particular design, uh, you have to ask for it under the Freedom of Information Act, which they can wriggle out of by saying it's commercially confidential. But if you do get any documents, you can find that about 80% of the documents are redacted. They're just blank pages, black pages. So you don't get any information whatsoever. And the, the problem is that a lot of anti-nuclear activists that... I hang around with are of the view that the Office of Nuclear Regulation along with the Environment Agency and the uh, Nuclear Decommissioning Authority and all the other um, backdrop to the nuclear industry are simply enablers of the industry of the, of the government policy to put nuclear power in place. And it, uh, you look at the way in which the um, generic design assessment which is the process that these reactors have to go through is carried out and you'll see that it suddenly and magically starts to speed up as the government puts down a de deadline for the final design approval. In 2012, the, the Office of Nuclear Regulation was asked to make sure that the um, EPR was going to be approved within the... And the outstanding issues that they had to deal with were legion. There were 31 of them. All of a sudden, there were 13. And then by the deadline that the government put down, there weren't any. But some of the uh, uncertainties about the design were put into a thing called the um, assessment findings. And one of the biggest problems they've got is the control and instrumentation of, about how you actually control these things, because they're fly-by-wire designs. That hasn't been resolved, and yet it's still got approval. So, you know, the whole process of uh, shedding light on it through the generic design assessment process is very suspect indeed, in my view. And I think the Office of Nuclear Regulation have got a lot to answer for in the way in which they carry out these, these projects. OK, so I withdraw everything I said about shedding light. Thank let's, you very much. Let's I call thought, it shed, thought... shedding redacted light <laughs> on the problem. I thought there would be a day when you listen to me. <laughs> uh, so, so any, any more questions? One at the back there, please. And, oh, lady down here first. Let me just take this lady. Sorry. Why don't, why don't we invest in nuclear fusion rather than nuclear fission? And I think the end product of nuclear fusion is hydrogen. Am I right? Um, well, nuclear fusion. Um, when I became director of Friends of the Earth in 1984, our very good energy campaigner said, you've been in the Green Party for 10 years, Jonathan, uh, which I had by that time, and you're very ill-informed about many things that you're going to need to understand to do the job as director of Friends of the Earth. This was Stuart Poiling, a little bit cool. Mm -hmm. And he said, OK, so you're going to have to go on a crash course to get yourself up to speed so that when you're stuck in front of a microphone, you don't come across like a lemon. And I thought, God, I've done 10 years in the bloody Green Party. The ecology parties then, well, I think I'm up for this. Um, but anyway, one of the places I had to go was to look at what was happening at Aldermaston and to look at what the research program was at that time from the UK government in nuclear fusion because we've invested in nuclear fusion I don't know how many billions over the years but we've, we've been one of the countries that has always held out this hope 
And I'm not joking, this was in 1984, and sure enough, I massively enjoyed my visit. It was brilliant. I mean, when you're surrounded by shiny, excited nuclear engineers, it's hard not to sort of wish them well, really. <laughs> and, and, of course, the story was, the, the solution to all our problems is going to be nuclear fusion. We really, we can crack everything with nuclear fusion. And I was kind of sitting there and saying, oh, okay, that's exciting. And, of course, then this magic figure materialized. So give us another 40 years, and nuclear fusion will be the technology that sorts out everything that the world currently has to deal with through fossil fuels and so on. Now, I'm being a little bit mean about this, but when you hear people talk about nuclear fusion now, you won't be surprised to know that it is still 40 years away. And I think it's one of those technologies that only ever survives by virtue of offering a 40-year time span <laughs> in which it will come to serve these amazing needs in society. And I'm just very sceptical about nuclear fusion. It's always been 40 years. It's it? always been 40 years. I'm not joking. Always 40 years. <laughs> and the response that, that us kind of solar enthusiasts say is, what is your problem? We've got a brilliant nuclear fusion reactor. It's just up in the sky doing all that stuff for us already. Just, just get good at harnessing it. And actually, that is what's happening. We will be a nuclear fusion planet by 2050. So much of our energy will come from the sun. Well, all of our energy, apart from geothermal and other things, but almost all of our energy comes from the sun anyway. But we will be a fusion power planet by the time we stop digging up old solar energy out of the ground and learn to use the incoming, real-time solar energy from the fusion reactor in the sky. We will be. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, it's nearly nine o'clock. Um, don't want to exhaust Jonathan. He's done us proud so far. Can we have just two more questions? And Should then we we'll... take three more questions? Three more questions? All together, and then I'll answer them all together. Okay, that's a good idea. Yes, sir, you at the back, please. Yeah. Gentleman at the back there, thank you. Thank you very much for coming, Jonathan. In 1989, we had 70% of councils against sizable C. We also had a 57,000 petition against the sizable C station. And the CGB, who were then in control, inverted commas, dropped it within a month. You mean sizable B? No, I mean size C okay. in 1989. They were also wanting that. So that's what stopped that one. But uh, on the positive side, we do have a, a reliable, uh, in fact, tidal source in currents and possibly in other basin tidal power uh, available all around our coasts, some more than others, of course, which could also help the wind power, which is going megawatt, absolute thousands of megawatts on our eastern coast, all the way up, it seems. And I'd be very pleased to um, endorse what happened to, uh, the, with the EDF people who didn't want to have uh, their lovely EDF-built reactor at, Heisman, at uh, Hinkley Point. So uh, can I... <laughs> Just say after they resigned, you know, um, good luck if you can get all your money, but I don't think I'll get any, quite frankly. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else, please? We'll take two more, and then Jonathan will deal with those. Lady down, right down the front, please. Just hang on a second. Right down the front, please. Okay. I just wanted to ask, how, how, sig sorry. Oh, I was gonna say, how significant is the is population size? to the success of alternative uh, renewable energies? Because when you were talking about Denmark and Costa Rica, though you gave some yeah. quite yeah, yeah. Um, uh, amazing figures. And I just thought, well, how would that relate to yep. Britain or big population? One more question, please. Where is it? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Emma. Yeah. I just wanted to ask about... Um, do you think the government might actually come clean about the nuclear power and nuclear weapons links? Because as they get more desperate, I think they could say to the population, 
OK, we, we really need this technology to keep our nuclear weapons going. And they could make us frightened enough to actually go with that because, you know, that's easily done. Because at the same time, the Chinese are pushing, you know, surely they need to keep their nuclear industry going as well to get that technology link. So do you think there might be a possibility that they will make that link clear? And if so, I fear that the British population would go along with it. Mm. Interesting. And were the other ones? That's it. That's three questions. We'd, we'd... Go on then, one more. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Jane. Go ahead. No, I don't know, does it? <laughs> uh, given the escalation costs, and they're going to be enormous, what is actually in it for EDF? Why are EDF still holding on to Hinkley and to Sizemore? <sighs> yeah. Good questions. Okay. Um, so I'm going to sort of work this around a little bit. So do I think the government will ever come clean on the link between nuclear power and nuclear weapons? I don't. I don't. I mean, the history of, of secrecy around our nuclear weapons story is so deep. It's so deep. I, since I read this report from Sussex University, Pete mentioned that I was chair of the Sustainable Development Commission between 2000 and 2009. And during that time, Tony Blair changed the Labour Party policy on nuclear power in the Energy White Paper in 2006? Six, I think. I think six. And, this, and we'd been very involved. The Sustainable Development Commission was used, invited by the government in 2002, 2003, to advise on nuclear power. We've done all of this stuff. And suddenly, I'm not saying completely out of nowhere, but suddenly we were sent these signals that the government was going to um, reverse the policy on nuclear power, which had been, quotes, kicked into the long grass, quotes, by the Labour uh, government from 2000 onwards. It was going to reverse it in the energy white paper. And we were sort of thinking, oh, where has that come from? And reading the Spru report, honestly, this is spooky. Because one of the things they pick up on is the discussions that took place under the Labour administration in 2002 and 2003 as the early plans for renewing Trident were first under discussion. I, I obviously knew nothing about that. Why, I was an advisor to government. They had no reason to tell me anything about this. But I had no idea that meetings of that kind were going on at that time. So I, I think secrecy is so deep in the DNA of this industry. I don't think the government would dare to come clean, to be honest. Um, you may be right that the British people might still vote for a nuclear deterrent at almost any cost. You may be right. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. We, you, I, I hope not. Um, so talk of coming clean. Why would EDF still be doing <laughs> Pressing ahead with this seemingly crazy uh, plan because the government has given them a completely cast iron profits, inflation proofed profits for 35 years. So, assuming they can get the bloody thing built, which would be bordering on a miracle, by the way, assuming they can get it built and pumping out the electrons. From that point on, they, they bear all the risk during the construction phase. Okay, this, is, this was the deal. that They would have to bear the risk, together with the French, uh, the other French investors, and the Chinese. They bear the construction risk. But from that point on, it's, it's we're in clover, mate. You know, we're, it's fantastic. It'll help us pay off all our debts in France. It'll be amazing. So just get the thing built at any cost, and it'll be okay. And this is the rationale. This is the rationale as well as which the French government has told EDF they're not going to build any new reactors in France. <laughs> OK, so our government, which owns us, by the way, majority owning, own, owner of EDF, our government's not going to let us build any more reactors in France, so we'd better find some other sucker country <laughs> which will let us build some reactors there. So, hey, that's how that one works. Um, does it matter what the size of the country might be from, from the point of view of 
renewable energy having this big scale difference. It, it, it is easier to do it with smart, smaller countries that have got a sense of their own common purpose. I mean, Denmark started investing in community-owned renewables 30 years ago. Um, uh, amazing story, and I say community-owned renewables because something like 60% of the wind power in Denmark is owned by local communities. It's not owned by big energy companies, it's owned by local communities. An astonishing percentage of the renewable energy in Germany is owned by local people, by cooperatives, uh, by small companies, by Greenpeace. Greenpeace owns great chunks of renewable energy generating capacity in Germany. So instead of having these vast, big energy companies, it's, uh, the big energy companies in Germany only have 40% of the total renewable energy market. Only 40%. The rest is owned by municipalities, <coughs> co-ops, etc., etc. So it does help having smaller units, but it's not a be-all and end-all. The biggest investor in renewable energy today by a million miles is China. Sorry, keep coming back to China. Um, they, are just, they are just investing sums of money you can't believe in, in wind and in solar. And because they've got massive capacity in their PV manufacturing companies, these vast companies that have fed cheap solar to the world, they're essentially subsidizing the rollout of solar now in China to an extraordinary degree. I mean, you don't mess around in China. The, the central government in China offered a, quotes, competition, quotes, to see which Chinese cities would be the first solar city in China. And 12 cities were told that they were going to be the first solar <laughs> cities in China. And lo and behold, they are en route to becoming the first solar cities. And you don't have a planning issue. If you're a citizen in China, in a solar city, you get solar cells on your roof, whether you like it or not. So it's a slightly different deal. But, but you don't have to be a small country. You can be a big country. Um, but I think we'd rather do it the Danish way, wouldn't we, than the Chinese way, probably. Which brings me on to Dong. Dong Energy. The acronym DONG stands for the Danish Oil and Something Gas Company. What's the N stand for? I can't remember something. Of it. National something or other. Yeah. And there was a time when DONG was a 100% hydrocarbon-based company. It just did oil and gas. And then, for various reasons, it had to diversify. Extraordinary story, this. Had to diversify. It started rather grumpily putting money into wind because that was the easiest thing to do. Danish government promoting it got quite brave, decided then to do some offshore stuff, and is now one of the world's most successful offshore wind companies in the world, building these huge offshore wind arrays, which are quite amazing to behold. Don came up with a statement a month or so ago, six weeks ago, in which they said, why are you all so excited about Hinkley Point? <laughs> we could do Hinkley Point with three big new offshore arrays. We could do Inky Point, and guess what? We would get it delivered for you by, say, 2018. <laughs> maybe, maybe 2019 if, you know, the weather's bad and our uh, installation vessel, because you've seen the latest size of offshore wind turbines now. These are monstrous. I mean, these are just unbelievable. These are 10 megawatt turbines now, so the blades of these turbines are just massive. So the installation vessels are hugely expensive, and, and they're, they, they're, obviously there aren't that many of them in the world today, so it might take a tiny bit longer. Hinkley Point, best estimate? 2030 completion date. Best estimate? 2030. That's EDF's estimate. That's EDF's estimate. So Dong is sort of saying... Don't panic, guys. Even if Hinkley doesn't work, we've got this amazing technology that is proven, that is starting to deliver the goods for the UK. You've seen how our renewable energy percentages are going up. And, and you know, for me, we are still a, a world leader in offshore wind. We're not a world leader in very much any longer in the renewable space. We're still a world leader 
in offshore, and actually it's, it is going to become a very big contributor to our low-carbon future. Bigger, I'm sorry to say, probably than tidal, because tidal is always a bit of a problem uh, in terms of environmental impacts. Um, again, have to make yourself unpopular occasionally. When I was chair of the Sustainable Development Commission, we did a big report on a tidal barrage on the Severn Estuary, and we came out in favour of a tidal barrage because it's 8% of the UK's electricity. Yes, it has significant environmental impacts, but it generates completely predictable low-carbon energy for the best part of 100 years. And for all we need the small stuff, we also need the big stuff. So tidal is controversial at the moment. The biggest favoured proposal is for a tidal lagoon, Swansea Bay tidal lagoon. There's a big review going on in government by Charles Hendry, former, environment, uh, former energy minister, apparently is going to come out with a glowing report saying Britain could pioneer the tidal lagoon technology. We have a perfect opportunity to do it in Swansea, Swansea Bay, a bigger one just down the coast at Cardiff. But we ought to get going on this. And the real story will be, will the government find enough money for the Swansea Bay tidal lagoon as they have found for Hinkley Point? <laughs> I end with a rhetorical question.